Welcome to the Temple of Pwn Part 1. Whoever is watching this in the future or possibly now. So this will mostly just be like a intro to kind of what you need to or what you should look into in the future possibly or just to refresh you, your memory on some things if you don't already know. And go into a little bit about buffer overflows. So first, we'll talk a little bit about GDB. Uh, the default version of GDB doesn't really look good. It's kind of garbage. And instead, you should use a wrapper for it. It's like Jeff or Pwndebug. You shouldn't use PETA. It's not great anymore. When it first came out, it was awesome. And people highly recommended it. But now it's outdated and not kept up and pretty much just caused more headaches than what's worth. So on the left, we'll actually have a version of or what Jeff looks like. And on the right, we have what? Debug looks like you can see that they kind of look similar and that's the only real difference is where the code is compared to where the stack is and how they show it and represent it so here's just a quick command list for GDB so when you run GDB and then your argument for your binary or whatever you can do start this will start the program and it'll try to break at main or start kind of depends on how the program is set up whether it can find main in the first place uh, ne ni next instruction goes to the next instruction in the set sometimes it might jump out of your current frame I'm not really sure why this happens I think GDB just can't figure out where you currently are and just kind of continues instead of next instructions si step instruction um, the difference between ni and si is that if you're at a function call and you si you actually step into the function call and will follow it so if you're kind of worried that next instruction might break you out you can use SI and it'll actually just, usually it's a safer method. Um, X forward slash any kind of number and then like one of these parameters and then the address kind of displays the value at that memory address. So X for like uh, bytes or kind of dump the memory, uh, D for decimal, B for binary, maybe bytes, I'm not really sure. S for strings, I, I have no idea what I does, never used it. I usually just use X and S. Uh, maybe sometimes D, uh, B, and then the address. That's a breakpoint at the address. You might need an ampers or not an ampersand, an asterisk before the address to like say, hey, this is a memory address. Break here. Uh, run just runs the binary at the start. So like instead of start where it sets the breakpoint, run will just run the binary and won't stop at all at or it won't stop at main or start at all. It'll just go until there's a breakpoint or until it's told to stop. It kind of just runs the binary like you would on the regular command line. Uh, disassemble or disass. This will attempt to disassemble the current function you're in, or you can specify a certain function to dis disassemble. This is useful if you want to set a breakpoint in a function. You'd be like, hey, I don't know what the exact offset is or exact address. You can just show me and then set the offset compared to that function. Uh, set address and then the value. This sets the value at the address. It's usually default to a D word, so four bytes. Um, in a lot of 64-bit binaries, you want to set this to, or you want to typecast the address to a like unsigned lolmon or void pointer, so it actually sets eight bytes. Uh, we'll probably talk about that at some point in the future, but right now it's not too important. And then other version-specific commands, there's a bunch of them, but here's just some examples: heap and then heap bins. Uh, heap is pwn debug. Heap bins is Jeff. Um, I've had in the past, I've had better luck with heap and pwn debug. But recently, Jeff has actually been really great with the heap, and I think it's actually better than Pwndebug now. So I prefer Jeff for heap stuff. Uh, then stack on Pwndebug, it shows like your current stack and like kind of follows it. It has, it's like, kind of does this view, but you can set a set number so you can continue down as much as you want and then just go from there. Um, another thing is Pwn tools. This is a Python library, so you're going to want to know how to type Python or kind of learn some Python. It's not really hard. If you know basic logic flows, you can kind of just script stuff together and interact with processes easier. I enjoy, or I like Pwn Tools because it's a simple socket control and simple process control. And there's lots of bonus features that Pwn Tools has, a shell code, address lookup, character generation, easy GDB interaction um, for local binaries only, of course. You can't really connect to something remote and then be like, hey, GDB attached to it. It's not how that works. Uh, easy packing, this is where in memory uh, data is stored in little endian, but usually we interact with stuff regularly, or like big endian. I'm not really sure if that's the correct way to, I don't really refer to it 
that way, I guess, but you usually need to pack your values. And then there's more features, like every time I look at it, there's always something new. Like recently I looked at it and there's like HTTP interactions. So if you want to send specific data, you just like, hey, pwn, pwn tools, make me an HTTP request. And then it'll actually set up the headers that you need to make everything look nice. So now we get into like what we're actually going to talk about this for this meeting is kind of buffer overflows. And this is just a simple intro, not really too in depth, but it'll give you some good knowledge to work off of and maybe continue in the future. So we'll, we're going to just talk about stack based. Uh, for, there's also uh, heat based. So I guess program based too. So like buffer overflows kind of range a lot. So you can overflow in the stack, you can overflow in the program, you can overflow in the heap. It's kind of stim or comes from the fact that maybe they're reading in too much data or they're just not sanitizing the data they're reading in or they're just not careful enough with handling their data in general. Um, yeah, so it occurs from miscalculations. Can cause too much data to be read in, yeah. So an example for that is like, if the local var one is a counter saying, on our second read, we're only gonna read in 20 characters, but we overflow local var two in over one, we can say, hey, now we can read in 50 characters or something like that. So this can actually just lead to further exploitation because maybe we only have a four byte or one byte overflow in var two, but this might allow us to get a 100 character overflow now. So here on the right is kind of how the stack looks. I'm showing it upside down to what lots of people show it, but it kind of doesn't really matter as long as you have understanding. So in a 32-bit or 64-bit, I guess, if you have enough arguments, this is how the stack would be laid out. You're going to first push your arguments to the stack, and then when you call the function, you're actually going to push the return address on the stack so the program knows where to come back to. And then you're going to push ebp, and then move, you're going to do some move if ebp esp stuff, but that's not really important. It just parts of the prologue, but whatever. And then you have your local variables where, and then ESP would probably point to your last local variable. So that might be EBP based, it might be ESP based, it doesn't really matter. But in this example, if we were, like I said earlier, if we were to overflow var2, we'd effectively be able to override var1, the value of EBP, the return address, and any previous arguments. So that kind of just depends where, since everything after var2 or before var2 is writable, we're not actually able to touch var3 at all, if that makes sense. So with that, I'll go into a little example. Let me move this over. There we go. Make my screen a little bit bigger. So with this, we have, uh, oh, yeah, we have a dot out, uh, exploit.py. We're not gonna look at that. That's just uh, in case I start to mess up. I might be a reference back to that. And then temp.c, so we can just infer that temp.c is what's actually running in a.out and look at it. And here we have a function and then main. We look like we're calling function with the value zero x dead beef. Uh, we have a variable called overflow me, print overflow me gets, it just gets straight in overflow me. And then if the key is equal to cafe babe, we run system. So we can see that the key is the value we passed in. But the problem is that there's no actual reference to the key and that it won't actually change at all, or it's not supposed to change at all in the regular program. So you're probably thinking, well, that's not possible. How are we supposed to even get to this system call in the first place? But if you remember back to the slides I just showed that since key is actually an argument pushed on, if we run file, we can see that this is 32 bits. So all the values are gonna be on the stack anyways. So if we actually make sure if we check, or if we overflow enough, we should be able to overflow the key. And we don't really have to worry about canary. I mean, there's none there, but since we don't actually return, it doesn't actually matter if the canary is the same or not. We can just overflow it anyways. If you want, you use uh, check sec, and then right here, there's no canary. Uh, these other ones don't really matter right now, but pi is position independent execution. We'll talk about that later, but that just mostly means hey, I'm loading this binary, it's gonna be at the same address every time, but since it's enabled, it's kind of like the local system saying ASLR is on, so, or the binary itself saying ASLR is on, so you can load me wherever you want just to make sure it's harder to hack. And then NX is, I don't actually know what it means, or I guess it's probably no executable, and this just means that the stack and the heap aren't executable, and that's not, I mean, it could be useful in our case if instead of 
the system call we were just able to overflow in general we could have a jump to ESP and then just put shellcode on the stack but since NX is enabled there's no real hope for that I guess we could M map a section and then do some more funky stuff but there's probably easier ways than without having to worry about that so if we actually just run the file once and just threw in some garbage we can see nothing happens but if we threw in a bunch of A's we can see that we actually get a segmentation point so you're probably wondering what's happening. So we're going to GDB. I'm using Pwn Debugger. I'm going to switch that back. Now I'll stay in Pwn Debug for this one. We're going to start. We're actually going to step. Oh, not step yet. We're going to next instruction all the way down to funk. And you can see we're at the call of funk right now. Step into it. Step over these thunks, which are set up the stack and EBX. It's not really important. It's just trying to run a 32-bit binary in a 64-bit system. Just how it works. We see with the printf, and then we have the gets. So if we put in all those a's again, we can see that on our stack, if we do stack 25, that right here, we can see that starting at 0 or 0x10 zero from ESP, we actually have a bunch of a's, and that it continues down all the way down t to about 5c, since this one also has 3 a's in it. So if we continue, we can see that, oh, I missed it up here. I want to actually stop right here where it does the compare to see if it's actually equal to cafe, babe, but it's an EBP plus 8, so we can just check down here anyways. So we can do a little x slash 1 wx dollar sign EBP plus 8, and we can see that it's all A's. So it's useful to know that we actually overwrote the value that's on the stack, but we didn't get the right value, so we have to do a little bit of magic. So what I think is an easy way to or an easy method to do this is just to use a cyclic it's kind of like a, it's a pwn tools edition but all it does is just generates a random string that you can also look up in but that's just too many characters so let's do cyclic and then let's do 100 so here we go if we put this string in then we could actually do a lookup to see where it's at so let's do gdb a dot out we can just do uh i probably don't want to run it because we want to figure out exactly where it is at that function and it won't actually break correctly. So we can set a breakpoint at funk, start or run it. So then this will jump us straight to funk. We don't stop at main at all. Put in our string. And then right here, if we can do it, uh, wx dollar sign ebp plus eight. And we can see that we actually have that string right there. But that's not really useful to us. I mean, if you can do some basic hex in your head, you can figure out that D is, I don't know, H or something, but that's A, 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 but I'm kind of too lazy to figure that out, so I'll just do a stack 15, and we can see EBP, oh, it's J, oh, that's pretty close, but EBP, oh, no, minus 4, minus 8, so it'd be this one, it'd be I, oh, one character off then, that's not too bad, but if we take this I, A, 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 and we just quit, and we do cyclic, dash L, and we can see that at character position 32 is where IAAA shows up, but that doesn't seem right. Should have probably gone in there and checked just to make sure that was the right address. Let's run it again just to be sure. So I think I'm, I think I might have gone the wrong way. Yeah. Oh, once I get there, I'll show you what I did wrong. Get to the gets. Send in the stream which I lost. Oof. This should work. Just copy that. Overflow. Next instruction. EBP. Here we'll just do a stack 25 again. Let's see EBP. What I think I did wrong was I did minus 8. I actually want to do plus 8. So it should be this one. And then we can just make sure with a print dollar sign EBP plus 8. And we can see 1D0, which is, yeah, right there. So it's going to be M. It wasn't even close with the H, but whatever. Cyclic dash L, look up 48. That seems right. So we can actually make an exploit file for this now. We're going to import our from pwn, import everything. We'll set our process to the A dot out. I mean, you could also do this all in just command line and pipe it in and then keep the file open, but I think it's just easier with the pwn tools. And what we want is just. Uh, if you want to test it out, we can do gdb 
dot attach to the process and that's as easy as it is and just dot interactive but there's gonna be some kind of or some leg involved with this so it's actually gonna break us at or when GDB finally attaches it's actually gonna be within the read of gets so it's not too perfect but just to be sir just to be safe we'll send in that string again but this time oops I think I pasted instead of copied we're gonna go back all the way to M and do BDBB. B. So if we finish this function, no, not step, because we don't want to step into this puts call. No, wait, went pull over it again. Do uh, x for slash one w x dot and EBP plus eight, and we can see that we have 62, 62, 62, 62, which is all Bs. And if you don't trust me, you can look up yourself on the ASCII table, but that's what it is. So we have our value that we want to overwrite exactly right. So now we just do a p dot send line, send a line, a times 48, and then anything after will be what we want to send it. So if we do cafe, babe, you're all probably thinking, wow, this was super easy. Got it first, or first like couple tries nothing to wor worry about so let's step into it or step next to it and we can see that instead of actually following this jump which is sure going into the jump because we thought that would be right it actually went back to the regular puts where it's going to say not nah, instead of doing the bin sh call so if we actually want to look at it again bp plus eight we can actually see that this isn't what we want this is actually going to be beba feka which is totally backwards or not really backwards but oh well, yeah considerably backwards but how data is read in since it's little indian it's going to have the first character the second character the third character the fourth character so if you look at cafe babe but what we want is this value to be cafe babe so this is where we can actually use this packing formula that they have and do just p32 is all it takes Normally you'd have to call import the struct library and then do a struct.pack and then know the kind of packing formula you want and then send in your value, but this just makes it so much easier. Cafe babe. And here you can if you for some reason the program was big Indian, you could still send it that way if you wanted, but we don't need to worry about that. So since I'm we're pretty confident this is gonna work this time, we're just gonna shoot for the stars and just send it. And we can see that we actually have execution. And that's how simple a buffer overflow is. So that's kind of all I had for this one. Oh, let's add a core file. Quit that. No more processes. And then if you ever want to kind of do some more work or anything, go to pwnable.kr and kind of get your hands on and try and learn how to interact with pwn tools. Uh, there's this file descriptor challenge, so I'll actually kind of just walk you through how to interact with different processes or file descriptors with phone tools. And if you get stuck, there you have the walkthrough right there for you to actually figure out what you should be going. Or if you just want another buffer overflow problem, there's one right here. Otherwise, there's probably hundreds online that you could easily find. But that was kind of all I had for this meeting, and thanks for watching.